Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the Lowy Institute. I'm Sam Rogovine. I'm a senior researcher here and director of digital at the Lowy Institute. I'm filling in for executive director Michael Fullylove today, who's in the US on uh, Lowy Institute business. Michael sends his apologies and I know he's sorry he can't be here for this occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our pleasure today to host Senator Richard Di Natale at the Lowy Institute. Earlier this year, the Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said it would be, quote, difficult to imagine the foreign policy landscape in Australia today without the Lowy Institute. We treasure that reputation, which comes from many sources. One of them, I think, is that we jealously guard our status as a nonpartisan institution. There is no Lowy Institute view of the world. The research we produce comes from a variety of viewpoints, and every day we host a vigorous policy debate on our web magazine, The Interpreter. We are open to various viewpoints, and most importantly, we subject all of them to scrutiny. As of today, the Lowy Institute will have hosted three party leaders in the last six months, and Richard Di Natale is the second Greens leader to speak here. Whenever a party leader speaks at the Lowy Institute, it's an important day. But just to add a, a little bit more gravity to Senator Di Natale's remarks today, a little frisson, if you like, I want to remind you of a piece of history. There's been a lot of talk over the last week or so, and I'm sure you've heard about whether Labor might, in the event of a hung parliament, form a coalition with the Greens in order to govern. Labor has dismissed that possibility, though many wonder what would actually happen if Mr Shorten's alternatives were another term in opposition or maybe a new election. It's worth remembering that in 1998, Germany's Social Democrats, led by Gerhard Schroeder, defeated Helmut Kohl's centre-right government in a federal election and went into coalition with the German Greens in order to form government. I wonder if any of you remember which cabinet portfolio the Greens leader, Joschka Fischer, held in Schroeder's cabinet. It was foreign affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr Richard Di Natale is leader of the Australian Greens. He was elected to the federal parliament in 2010 and is the Greens' first Victorian senator. Prior to entering parliament, Richard was a GP and a public health specialist. He worked in Aboriginal health in the Northern Territory, on, a, on HIV prevention in India, and in the drug and alcohol sector. Senator Di Natale will speak for about 30 minutes, after which I'll be back to moderate the Q&A. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Senator Richard Di Natale. Uh, thanks so much, Sam, for that uh, very generous introduction. I want to thank you for the invitation uh, to speak here today. I want to thank the Lowy Institute uh, as well, more broadly. Uh, it is uh, a great honour to be speaking uh, here today. Let me also acknowledge uh, my parliamentary colleagues, David Shoebridge, uh, potentially the next member for Grainler, Jim Casey. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any other uh, parliamentarians in the room, but uh, acknowledge them as well. I want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, and I want to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Now, when I first came to the leadership of the Australian Greens just over a year ago, I made it very clear that we needed to repair the relationship between non-Indigenous and Indigenous Australia, people from the world's oldest surviving culture. We're now moving through a process of constitutional recognition, but it is our view that this should be one step on a pathway towards recognising sovereignty and ultimately to achieving treaties. Now, the challenges that we face as a nation are truly global. Climate change, resource scarcity, growing inequality, conflict, the mass displacement of people. In order to meet these challenges, we have to have a global view. We need to move away from those old polluting industries of last century that are destabilising our world. We need to move towards greater regional cooperation and where we demonstrate real leadership in addressing these challenges. Over the course of the Abbott, now Turnbull government, uh, we've heard a lot about the threats to our national security. The government's gone to great lengths to counter the threat of violent extremism. We've seen the cancelling of passports of Australian citizens. 
the implementation of new national terrorism threat advisory systems, and we've seen billions of dollars poured into the funding uh, into our national security agencies. Uh, we, of course, recognise that uh, violent extremism is a threat to Australia, and it's a growing issue globally to which we have to respond. But all of the evidence suggests that the greatest gains will be achieved by addressing conflict and extremism at its source, uh, using diplomatic channels uh, to pursue a global response uh, to a global problem. And on that measure, I think the government uh, hasn't achieved what it could have achieved. But its biggest failure, the Abbott Turnbull government's biggest failure, is its pig-headedness in refusing to acknowledge that global warming and all of the things that flow from that, poverty, scarcity of resources, instability, and the conflict that it creates, represents a much bigger threat to our national security. Now, don't just take our word for it. John Powers, a US Iraq veteran and advisor to the Obama administration, has said, in the security world, decisions are made by a careful evaluation of risk, and climate change is the mother of all risks. Now, in the US, this is a consensus statement. It's not controversial. The Department of Defense has openly declared global warm warming an urgent and growing threat to our national security. We've got the Pentagon, we've got NATO member states and the G7 all taking seriously the threat of global warming and that po the threat that global warming poses to national security. We've got Dr Chris King at the US Army Command who put it this way, we aren't prepared for a 100-year war, and that is the scale and breadth of what climate change presents. History confirms that nobody knows how to win a 100-year war. Now, compare that to the Australian government's 2016 defence white paper, which barely mentions global warming and certainly doesn't identify it as a threat to national security. So while you've got top brass in the US, being issued with directives to make global warming a priority, you've got the Australian government with its head in the sand. In a recent interview, President Obama said that ISIS is not an existential threat to the United States. Climate change is a potential existential threat to the entire world if we don't do something about it. Now, of course, this isn't to minimise the threat of ISIS but it is a recognition that global warming left unchecked is a direct threat to our very existence. And it takes a hell of a lot of courage to make a statement like that when the fight, of, the fight against ISIS is front and centre in the minds of many governments and their citizens, particularly in the US. But leadership requires courage. Global warming is a threat multiplier. It exacerbates drought, famine, displacement, food and water scarcity uh, and disease. As again, the President of the United States said, this makes every other problem we've got worse. That's above and beyond just the ex existential issues of a planet that starts getting into a bad feedback loop. Now we're already seeing drought stricken farmers in Northwest Kenya fighting each other for water and cattle. We're seeing environmental changes fueling violence and military conflict in Afghanistan. India and Pakistan. We've got climate crises in rural areas and destroyed farmland and coastal zones that are pushing people into urban drug wars in Brazil and Mexico, all documented. We've got a study published in uh, Proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences that says that extreme drought in Syria between 2006 and 2009 was mostly, uh, most likely due to global warming and that the drought was a factor in the violent uprising that began in 2011. This is the future if we continue on the government path of inaction on global warming. This is the future that we face. Yet there we were on the first day of an election campaign with the Prime Minister saying that having an ambitious climate reduction target would reduce our leverage in international obligations. Well, what nonsense. What a remarkable revelation, completely misunderstanding the way those global negotiations work. And having been in Paris, I can tell you when those negotiations were occurring, we are an outsider in the global climate movement. 
We've chased off foreign investment in clean energy and we've reduction targets that would keep us as the worst per capita polluter in the world, tied with that uh, wonderful uh, climate champion, Saudi Arabia. Now, we realise that setting ambitious targets sends a signal to the global community. It says we're serious about transforming our economy and to do that, we need to have serious targets. So we have a science-based target of 60 to 80% reductions below 2000 levels by 2030, and we want to get to net zero emissions by 2040 at the latest to avoid the fast approaching tipping points, which President Obama talks about, from which there will be no safe return. So this isn't just about preserving our environment or transforming our economy, but as the American Defence Forces said, it is about preserving our national security as well. The impact of global warming is going to fundamentally change the character of our foreign relationships. The science is crystal clear. We have to keep global warming to below 2 degrees, preferably below 1.5 degrees, to avoid catastrophic climate change. And to get this done is going to require an unprecedented commitment. To fail on this front means unprecedented global and regional instability. Of course, here in Australia, the cost of forging ahead with those new coal mines is that we drive our neighbours into the uh, in the Pacific from their homes. And we had the uh, president of Kiribati, Sanoti Tong, who said clearly, "What we are talking about is survival." It's not about economic development. It's not about politics, it's survival. And last year, the Kiribati government purchased 20 square kilometres of land in Fiji as a backup plan for food security and possible, possibly even relocation of its citizens. That's the future we're talking about. And yet in the midst of that, what did we see from our immigration minister, Peter Dutton and Tony Abbott? We saw them caught out joking about the desperate situation of Pacific Islanders whose very existence is threatened by global warming and rising sea levels. When uh, Minister Dutton said that uh, time doesn't mean anything when you've got water lapping at your door, we had a really rare insight. It's away from that careful language that characterises international diplomacy but it was a, a rare insight into how our leadership actually um, treats our closest neighbours. Um, earlier uh, this year, I was able to uh, visit the Great Barrier Reef and saw the devastating coral bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef and, of course, the areas of Tasmania's ancient wilderness destroyed by unprecedented fires. Uh, I live in a rural community where people are telling me all the time how rainfall patterns have changed dramatically over their lifetime. I've got colleagues in the medical profession who have shown me how advanced spread of some vector-borne diseases is climate-related. But one of the most worrying things, of course, is that modelling demonstrates that global warming will usher in an unprecedented displacement of people and a um, refugee crisis. As Patrick Sykes uh, recently noted in Foreign Affairs, for this one, there'll be no tyrants to blame and the migrants won't be escaping war. They'll be fleeing nature, specifically the ocean, and they'll have no home to return to. Some people might actually take issue with the fact that uh, Patrick Sykes says that there are no tyrants to blame. Um, when you see what happened to Australia's climate laws, which were described by the uh, International Energy Agency as template legislation when you saw the repeal of those laws. The only country in the world to undo strong action on climate change. It's hard to agree with the assessment that no one's to blame. Now, our global treaties don't accommodate people fleeing natural disasters. They don't uh, accommodate those things. And uh, we do think it is absolutely critical that there are global diplomatic efforts to establish an international agreement on how to respond to people displaced by global warming. We have to ensure that those global diplomatic efforts take place. And in Australia, the Greens advocate for a special form of humanitarian visa for people who are displaced by global warming. That will be the future. Unfortunately, though, here in Australia, on this issue, the debate seems to be stuck in another century. As I said, I was in Paris last year 
for the signing of the climate agreement. And what struck me most was that Australia's political establishment is lagging so far behind foreign governments, uh, the business community, uh, civil society in realising the huge economic opportunities that exist with the transformation to the clean renewable energy economy. And by world standards, we're a wealthy, well-educated society. We have massive, massive research potential through many of our institutions, the CSIRO. In fact, the two agencies that the Greens helped establish with Labor in the last parliament, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. We have the potential to export that technology to the rest of the world, not just to countries with large rural populations, for example, in rural France, the US, China, etc., but also to those millions of people around the world who don't have access to a centralised grid. And it's a bit like the, what's happening in much of the developing world where you're seeing technology leaping over fixed telephone exchanges to mobile phones. Australia can help those countries without access to power to leap over expensive, last century, last century centralised uh, uh, grids to a t much more autonomous clean energy, microgrids, smarter grids. But to do it, we've got to support those institutions that allow us to export that technology. And we have both the government and the Labor Party committed to stripping a billion dollars from the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and to prevent it from using capital grant funding to, to, to uh, fund those projects. One of my key priorities going into the next parliament is to work with the next government to reap the potential that Australia's energy exports and technology transfer, transfer hold for the new economy. Now, despite the Pentagon's prescience about the risks of global warming, the same can't be said for its understanding of the way US foreign and defence policy have contributed to greater instability in the world. The US, along with Australia as its partner, has time and time again failed to learn from its mistakes. We are their biggest backers, with Australia the only nation to have joined the United States in every major military intervention in the past century. Both world wars, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, Afghanistan and Iraq. Our unfailing support for the US means that Australia has been complicit in the horrific consequences born as a result of these foreign incursions. The situation in Iraq, for example, is a horrifying, deadly testament to this. And you've got George Bush, who led the world, including Australia, into this conflict. And it is a decision that is now seen by most credible analysts as one of the most grievous strategic disasters in modern history. A conflict that we opposed right from the outset. The violent, decade-long occupation which followed shattered Iraq's social and economic structures. It ignited long dormant sectarian tensions that have contributed to a regional reign of violence by Islamic State. The brittle institutions of Iraqi governance were bombed into existence by the United States and, and its allies, and they now threaten to collapse entirely. Extensive research has illustrated the link between foreign, po foreign military occupations in places like Iraq and the rise of extremism. In the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks and throughout the war on terror, US occupation was linked to increases in mortality, to displacement and poverty, creating fertile ground for recruitment into extremist groups. It's a conclusion that's backed up by intelligence organisations around the world who have confirmed that the 2003 invasion of Iraq helped grow a new generation of radicalisation. Unfortunately, and despite clear evidence of the horrific consequences of US uh, foreign incursions, the US-Australia alliance remains the primary influence on the way Australia relates to the world. In failing to pursue a more independent foreign policy, we renounce our ambition to be a confident 21st century nation and in doing so, we undermine our own national interests. By following the US into those airstrikes in Syria, we contribute further 
to destabilisation in a region torn apart by an illegal invasion in 2003, and we make Australians less safe as a consequence. Though the Prime Minister's reluctance to commit further troops to the conflict in Iraq and Syria in December 2015 might show a departure from the usual script, and we absolutely welcome that, our troops shouldn't be there in the first place. We would be much better served by a strategy to combat extremism with inclusion at home while supporting global efforts to cut off financial and personnel support to Islamic State. Instead, we've blindly followed the US into yet another conflict with no clear strategic objective and without really pausing to ask the question, whose interests are we serving? The integration of our foreign and defence policies with the interests of the United States extends to their presence on Australian soil. We've got ground stations, places like Pine Gap, which have supported a re regime, uh, not at all transparent, around drone assassinations in any country in which the US chooses to conduct them with the resultant civilian casualties. Now, despite the stifling bipartisan consensus um, and unquestioning consensus around the US alliance, raising questions about its benefit to Australia and the world is hardly a radical position. As former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser has argued, our military and intelligence capabilities have become ensconced within the US military infrastructure to such a point the two have become blurred. We've become so enmeshed with America's strategic aims that we jeopardise our own future security and important bilateral relationships in the region. And as former Australian ambassador to China, Stephen Fitzgerald has reflected, Gough Whitlam at the time enraged Washington when he spoke out publicly against the 1972 Christmas bombings of Hanoi. But I quote, like it or not, in the end, America accepted his reframing of relations. It is right to question the benefit of the alliance and to review it so that it is something that serves the Australian national interest and the global interest. We're now looking at a whopping $17 billion allocated to acquire F-35 Joint Strike Fighters, which have been described by a number of people within the establishment as, I quote, a failure waiting to happen, an embarrassment, and all sorts of other colourful language. We've also got over $50 billion plus on 12 now potentially nuclear-powered submarines and another five to six billion on the weapons that support them, which is the largest procurement program in this nation's history. It's a massive dividend to the arms manufacturers and it comes sponsored by the unity ticket, uh, Labor and Liberal, the increased def defence spending of 2% GDP. And we've got to recognise that this comes at a massive opportunity cost. This is billions of dollars that we aren't putting into schools, into hospitals, into essential infrastructure. Yes, we do support the modernisation of defence force capabilities. For example, the purchase of up to six submarines to replace the Collins class um, capability. But we also believe that defence policy should be about keeping Australia and our region safe and st uh, stable, not using defence policy as a substitute for industry policy. The difference between buying six submarines and 12 is equivalent to funding the National Broadband Network shortfall. Just one of those submarines, just one of them, could, um, could be used on foreign aid to uh, massively increase our contribution. The difference between buying 72 Joint Strike Fighters or smaller tried and tested aircraft could deliver transformational investments to make our cities more resilient to climate change. So we don't support a mandated 2% target. We think there needs to be a national debate. Remarkable that one of the biggest increases in government expenditure would go through without a debate about whether that's a wise investment. We don't accept the fact that defence spending is a sacred cow. How is it that we can have enormous scrutiny on our health and education budgets 
and yet we can have so many procurements within defence that don't meet basic objectives. So we believe in a defence force that protects Australia, not one that serves to substitute as industry policy and not one that serves the interests of a foreign power. Where Australia could be a leading voice in the, um, on the global stage is in the global nuclear disarmament movement. But here again, we're held back by our unwavering support of the US alliance. Both the 2009 and 2013 defence white papers referred to Australia's reliance on Washington for extended nuclear deterrence. The former Australian ambassador to the US, Dennis Richardson, even made a submission to the United States Congress Nuclear Posture Review, calling on them to explicitly confirm that they would come to our aid if our security were threatened. In his words, he wanted to be sure countries like Australia do not need to develop their own nuclear weapons. Australia has repeatedly refused to rule out nuclear weapons use, instead emphasising the security benefits of nuclear weapons. It's among the most active nuclear allied states seeking to oppose and undermine moves through the open-ended work group on nuclear disarmament toward a much needed nuclear ban treaty. This kind of dangerous position not only undermines Australia's safety, but that of the world. And we isolate ourselves with this stance. There's real progress being made towards the prohibition and elimination of nuclear, nuclear weapons. It's happening right now. The humanitarian pledge, which recognises the need for nuclear weapons to be explicitly prohibited under international law was supported by 127 countries at the Vienna Conference on the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons in December 2015, but Australia was not one of those 127 countries. No state or international body could adequately address the immediate humanitarian emergency or long-term consequences caused by nuclear weapons detonation. The only way to protect against the horrendous impacts from nuclear weapons and nuclear war is to abolish them once and for all. And yet, our tight-knit alliance with the US makes us more prone to those dangers rather than having a more independent po foreign policy. As former Prime Minister Fraser described it, our relationship with the US has become a paradox. Our leaders argue we need to keep our alliance with the United States strong in order to ensure our defence in the event of an aggressive foe. Yet the most likely reason Australia would need to confront an aggressive foe is our strong alliance with the US. It is not a sustainable policy. That from the former Prime Minister of the country. Of course, it doesn't have to be this way. An independent and confident Australia is possible one that respects international law and that protects human rights. When our leaders stand independently, when they show courage and articulate a clear vision, we've shown that we can punch above our weight in the world. Australia's stand against the Japanese whaling industry is one example. We had civil society and government coming together with clarity and conviction. It's evident in Australia's successes at the United Nations Security Council under foreign ministers of various political stripes, including uh, the current foreign minister, Julie Bishop's leadership of a key resolution regarding access to the crash site of MH17 and the emergency aid to civilians caught in the Syrian civil war. If we can bring the same tenacity that we did to these circumstances and to our broader foreign policy, there will be enormous benefits for Australia, for the region and for the world. Underpinning this independence and courage must be an understanding that we cannot shirk our responsibilities in the world. We've now got the government vying for a seat on the United Nations Human Rights Council. I have to ask, what is the point when we regularly throw our own human rights responsibilities out the window? What kind of leadership could we possibly offer when we don't have our own house in order? We only have to look at how Australia has been at work in our region to see this in action. 
Look at the behaviour of Australia towards East Timor around our maritime boundary. And utterly reprehensible accusations of bugging cabinet rooms of the East Timorese government under the cover of a foreign aid donation. Instead of advocating for those people who are imprisoned indefinitely in West Papua, we funded groups such as Detachment 88. They are the very same police force that have been accused of human rights abuses, of harassment and torture and extrajudicial killings of the West Papuans. In exchange for Sri Lanka's help to prevent people seeking asylum from leaving their shores, we gave their secret police military equipment, like those white vans, synonymous in Sri Lanka with the enforced disappearance and murder of its citizens. And of course, actively undermining UN attempts to investigate human rights abuses and war crimes. We're currently in the midst of an unprecedented retreat on our commitments to human rights, asylum seekers, on foreign aid, on global warming, on clean energy investment. A confident Australia would understand there is a better way to welcome people seeking asylum in this country. Instead of denying people freedom and safety in offshore detention camps, instead of trampling over basic human rights, the treaty commitments we've made, driving people to such despair that they are self-harming. We are talking about five-year-old children who put a rope around their neck and self-harm because we have a policy that at its core says we will harm innocent people in an effort to send a message to someone else. Now, that is a line that a civilised society should never cross. Sadly, that is a bipartisan policy. There are ways through this mess. We spend billions of dollars continuing to keep people in those hell holes offshore, despite the fact that we know they are both now in crisis. Next year, the government will spend approximately $400,000 for each man, woman and child held on Nauru. We're not going to see an increase next year to Australia's humanitarian intake, despite the biggest global flow of refugees since World War II. It just takes a bit of leadership. We close down those camps. We spend that money helping people rather than hurting them. We create legitimate pathways through the UNHCR so people don't feel the need to go onto one of those leaky boats. We also understand that the root causes of instability would have, could be addressed through a properly funded international aid program instead of gutting it to the barest bones. It's why we've announced our commitment to increase foreign aid to 0.7% by 2025. It's remarkable that we're having the debate here because in the UK, again, a bipartisan consensus on that 0.7% target and under successive governments, Labor and Conservative alike, that target has been enshrined in legislation. They've met that target at a time when Australia has gutted its foreign aid budget by over $11 billion since 2013, plunging our aid investment to a shameful 0.22% of GNI. It's the lowest level of international aid funding since records began more than 50 years ago. And it's an indictment on both the coalition's attitude towards the world's most vulnerable people. And indeed, we haven't heard from the Labor Party about whether they will uh, restore that funding. Let's remember that the coalition cuts built on the $5.8 billion already implemented under the former Labor government. And when asked last year, on the ABC about the restoration of those cuts, the Shadow Foreign Affairs Minister, Tanya Plibersek, said that Labor certainly wouldn't continue with the aid cuts that are scheduled by this government. We need to hear an ironclad commitment about whether the Labor Party will restore that huge cut to foreign aid. A confident Australia would have a clear vision, not just for our own clean energy economy, but for that of the world. 
There are great opportunities for an Australia that capitalises on this vision. As one of the sunniest, windiest countries in the world, with abundant space, we can lead the transition to a clean energy powered future right across the globe. A confident Australia would have a head of state that was actually an Australian, someone of merit, not just there because of their birthright. We've now got three leaders in this country, all of whom support a republic, at least in name. We've got state and territory leaders declaring their support. There is more momentum now than ever before. And Leadership would mean turning this talk and this support into concrete action, real steps towards becoming a republic. It is within our power to use our relationships around the world to protect human rights, to reduce inequality, and in the process to create a safer and more stable world for everyone. Australia can be a more confident, a more courageous country. We have the smarts, we have the economic strength, and we have the decency to do so. Unfortunately, that's just not something reflected in the policy priorities of either the Prime Minister or the Opposition Leader. When we focus on violent extremism to the exclusion of the security threat posed by global warming, when we rush to follow the United States into Iraq and Syria, but fail to demand a clear long-term strategy with clear objectives, when we window dress at the Paris Climate Conference, but at home slash the renewable energy target and scrap the world leading price on carbon, we fail to live up to Australia's great potential. That has to change. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Some water down there, if you like. Right. Senator, thank you very much. Uh, those remarks were thoughtful, broad, deep. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions now. Uh, I'd ask you to just, you know, come up with some some uh, interesting questions of your own. Please state a question, not not a, not make a statement or a speech of your own. Uh, let us know your affiliation if you have one. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that climate change was a major part of your address, mm. and I hope some of the questions do address that. Since it's not my specialty, I'm going to start by uh, focusing on something else. Uh, it occurs to me that if I can be bold enough to speak on behalf of the so-called foreign policy commentariat, of which I'm a member, I think the common criticism of the Greens is that they don't take realpolitik seriously enough. We live in an anarchical international system in which states ultimately have to secure their own, uh, look after their own security. And it's clear now that Asia is becoming the new cauldron of uh, great power competition in the world. Yet in your remarks, you said almost nothing about US-China tensions. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't talk about China's determination to impose its will in the South China Sea. Uh, and maybe even ultimately uh, China's ambition to displace the United States as uh, the foremost regional power. I think it's to the enormous credit of the Greens that it's always taken the threat of nuclear weapons seriously, and you reinforce that today in your remarks. But it seems to me if we do take nuclear weapons seriously, we also have to wrestle with the realities of great power competition uh, and come up with some ideas about how we can manage that. Your response? Um I, I suppose just to respond to um, the, the focus on the speech on, on climate change, I mean, the, the emphasis really was to try and give uh, force to the argument that we need to start treating this as a national security threat, hence the, hence the uh, focus on that issue. Um, no one would argue for a moment that the issues in the South China Sea, China's, um, some would say, aggressive uh, incursion into that area, that it's... Um, uh, purchasing, uh, well, it's uh, effectively gaining territory uh, is a huge problem in the region. Um, the question for us is, as a nation, is how are we going to mediate our way through one established superpower and an emerging one? And is it in Australia's national interest to be so clearly aligned uh, with the US when it comes to that issue? And I know that people 
Uh, I think you talk about the foreign policy establishment. I think there are different views about how we should respond to that particular threat. Um, I think that on this issue that wiser heads must prevail, uh, that we need to look at the issue of um, uh, arbitration if necessary. We've got avenues through which to do that. And it seems to me that we have not uh, pursued aggressively enough uh, the option of uh, arbitration and a um, diplomatic resolution to that specific conflict. Uh, it seems that the response has been largely uh, focused on um, the, um, the military response and uh, international law exists for a reason. There are ways to be able to prosecute a, ca a case through those processes and I think that should be Australia's focus. Um, but yes, of course, like many people, we have, we have major concerns about the conflict in the South China Sea, the, specifically the Spratly Islands now, um, becoming a, a real cause for concern and a cause for concern in the region. Thank but you. I, I, would, I would posture that I, I don't think anybody has um, uh, uh, the, the, you know, a, a clear response about how Australia should respond to that threat. Now, from the floor, please, this gentleman here, please wait for the microphone. Other side, right there. Um, thank you, Senator. Um, I suppose I'd like to question, which is sort of touching on global warming, but mm. it seems that global politicians really haven't addressed the elephant in the room, which to me is the exponential growth of popul world population. We've seen 30% growth in population in the last 20 years to over 7 billion people. If we assume that continues as the way it is, we'll be probably in 2050, somewhere around 9 to 10 billion people in the world. <coughs> A lot of the issues you talk about around global warming really are just sandbagging the tsunami of population growth. What policies do you believe worldwide politicians need to make to address this issue? Because if we don't address it, all of, your, all of the global yep. warming, the scarcity of land, etc., are going to cause us major problems. Yep. So the, I suppose the first thing I would say is it's very important to um, consider the equation around um, impacts of population as a function of population and consumption. Those two things are, go hand in hand. And if you look at um, per capita emissions, uh, it is countries like Australia that uh, far exceed many other developed countries. So let's not um, uh, just accept that it's simply a function of population. It's a function of both of those things. However, population is still an important part of that equation. Uh, most international demographers would suggest that population will peak towards the end of the century at about 9 billion uh, and that uh, ultimately um, the, uh, the reason for that is that um, with increasing development in low income countries uh, we'll see fertility rates decline and that's been the history um, of developed countries for many, for many um, decades. Um, in terms of how do we try and address that issue globally, I think the single biggest um, the single biggest response uh, is the education uh, of particularly women who are denied an education in many low-income countries and giving uh, people an opportunity, particularly young, young women who are denied an education has been shown, I think, through development to be the most effective intervention. Uh, once you give uh, somebody an, uh, an opportunity for future employment, uh, in an environment where they may have been denied that previously, uh, it has a significant effect on fertility rates. And so that brings me straight back to foreign aid. Uh, we, we can't... Foreign aid is so critical in issues like global population and ensuring that we start to address that issue more fully. It's, an, it's absolutely related to the issue of refugees and asylum seekers, and I know that having spoken to a number of organisations who work in this space, the great need for greater foreign aid investment in Syria um, at the moment and how critical that is in terms of addressing the movement of peoples. Um, it, it, is, it is fundamental to everything, uh, to, 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 to almost everything I've talked about during, during the speech. And so if Australia was going to do anything as a global citizen, it would be to increase its foreign aid budget and to ensure that we have programs that allow women in low income countries to get an education and employment opportunities that they're currently denied. Thank you. Alex Oliver at the front. Just wait for the mic, Alex. 
Thank you, Senator, for a very thought-provoking speech. Um, we have a public opinion program here at the Lowe Institute, which has been running for 12 years now, and one of the most consistent findings we've had throughout that 12 years is a very strong support for the US alliance. And at any one year, we find that more than 90% of Australians are overall in support of the alliance. And when we drill down further into the reasons for that, they say that paradoxically, paradoxically we would have to spend more on our defence without the alliance and that the alliance make us, makes us safer from pressure from countries like China. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment on that because mm. your, your thoughts about the alliance and withdrawing from it um, would seem not to have much mm. public support at all in what is what has been seen as a cornerstone of Australia's security. So, so just to be clear, I mean, I have been critical of our blind adherence to uh, US foreign policy and the terms of the alliance as it's currently understood. I think it's really important to make that point. Um, in any relationship, uh, I think uh, if you have uh, two parties who respect each other uh, and where there is a maturity within that relationship, then the obligation should be on Australia to be able to speak up against uh, mistakes that are made by uh, the bigger partner in that relationship. So I'm being critical of the terms under which the alliance seems to operate in a very bipartisan way. Now. I think we need to redefine the terms of the alliance. I think what we need to do is to have a debate in this country. And it's just remarkable. You can't debate this stuff anymore. Uh, it's, there is this stifling bipartisan consensus that simply to even raise questions about the nature of our relationship with the US, the current terms of the alliance, um, is somehow, it's heresy. Well, it wasn't always that way. And, uh, you know, as I said, Gough Whitlam, uh, Malcolm Fraser, hardly bastions of, well, at least in Malcolm Fraser's case, of leftist radicalism. You know, this is, this is a, I think, a very thoughtful response to what is a, a great paradox for us. Um, what we need to have is a debate about what the purpose of our defence policy is. Let's, be, let's have an open acknowledgement that what we are saying is we don't have a, a defence force if uh, what you're suggesting there is that Australia's defence force um, is simply an arm of the US Defence Force and that our capabilities are so entwined that um, uh, Australia would have no prospect of, being of, of, of um, uh, responding to a conflict uh, on its own. Well, let's at least be honest about that. But that's not the debate that we're having in this country at the moment. We, have, we, ch we like to have our cake and eat it. Um, I think it's also important to recognise, as we heard earlier, the growing influence of China and what does our relationship with the US mean in terms of um, the emergence of China as a superpower. We should have a debate about those things. I mean, we had uh, the uh, incursion into Iraq followed by, um, uh, well, most recently in Syria. I think we spent five minutes in the Australian Parliament talking about it before we signed off on sending troops to Syria. Five minutes. I mean, think of the debate. I mean, we had 48 hours talking about Senate voting reform. Uh, we had five minutes talking about the incursion in Syria. Now, I'd like to hear those arguments being discussed in Australia's parliament. I'd like to hear the contributions of people who um, have different perspectives on these issues. We just don't have that at the moment. There is no national debate. And part of the problem is that we have, as I said, this bipartisan, unquestioning consensus at the moment, which I don't think serves us well, because we're unable, we, we don't have a discussion about um, what is the purpose of our defence force, what is the relationship with the US, um, is it, I mean, is our relationship with the US so tied into defence strategy that um, uh, what, what we actually have is uh, effectively an arm, arm of the US defence force? I mean, they, they are questions that um, as a parliament uh, and as a nation, I don't think we spend enough time reflecting on. This gentleman, yeah. Ah, sorry, the gentleman. Yes, the black jacket. Thank you, thank you, uh, Senator. First off, uh, whether we all agree with all your positions or not, one thing you do bring is a very measured and calm tone and detailed tone to debate, which isn't always true in all of our political. So, uh, thank you for that. If I could, however, follow up on the point about China and the South China Sea, you emphasise the importance of arbitration, and yet China has repeatedly and categorically ruled out any jurisdiction of the International Court mm. of Justice yep. 
or the applicability of the United Nations common law of the sea in that, uh, in that area. Doesn't that go to the moderator's point about a lack of realpolitik as to what actually go goes on in that area? The second part of the question then would be, you've questioned in some depth the nature of the US, uh, the benefit to Australia of the US uh, um, al alliance, but then also seem to go on to uh, severely question the size of Australia's own defence spending. It would seem to me that, uh, as you just said, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You've either got to have one or the other. Admittedly, you would argue we don't need both, which is the current situation, but if you question the alliance, independent spending on defence might become even more important, might it not? Thank you. Um, so on the first point, I, I mean, as, again, having read the contributions of various people to the debate around the South China Sea, I haven't seen anybody come up with a clear position about how to navigate our way through that. I, I just don't think there is an obvious one. Uh, and at the moment, it feels like the choices are very binary and it's either um, back the US, uh, which goes to much deeper questions uh, about that relationship, uh, or trying to find our way, uh, another way through that conflict. I, I, on the second point, um, I suppose it comes down to questions about the nature of our defence force, defence capability and so on. And again, I'll go to that point. We had a 2% commitment um, on defence spending. Uh, one of the most significant contributions uh, when it comes to government expenditure, at a time when we're told about the debt and deficit disaster, again, not a skerrick of debate. And if there's anything that we can do through our presence here and certainly in the parliament is to start raising questions about those things uh, and to raise questions about the very nature of what our defence force is there. Let's have an open debate about whether the Australian defence capability exists simply to supplement um, our relationship with the US or at the moment we're being told that we're doing both. And we, you know, it, by your own words, it seems that you don't think we can do both. So let's at least have a debate about those things. And we haven't had a debate or a discussion or any you know, meaningful contribution from either side of politics, major parties. They just, it's one of those issues you simply can't talk about. Uh, there was a time when you could. And as I said, it's not just me that's questioning that relationship. I return to you know, former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser, who's raising these issues. And I think they're legitimate questions to ask. And as a nation, we should start having that conversation and we're simply not doing it. We have time for one final question. Uh, Scott Lowe, uh, undecided voter and potential Green voter, but undecided on that. Uh, you laid, laid out your policies very clearly on a range of social and environmental issues and on foreign policy. Uh, I noticed that one of your colleagues recently spoke with what I would describe as enthusiasm for taking advantage of low interest rates and cranking up the national debt. So could you talk a bit about uh, your position and your, your party's mm. position on, on that, that question? Sure. Um, well, we've got, again, it's a very, I think it's a, it's a very mainstream position. Uh, many economists will, uh, that we've spoken with have said that now is precisely the right time to invest in productivity building infrastructure. Um, and we can talk about what that looks like and ensuring that there's a sound business case for those sorts of investments, but obviously public transport, clean energy and so on would all fit the bill. Now, um, the, the time to do that is at a time of low interest rates. Uh, we have very low interest rates at the moment. Um, our view is that we do, again, as has been suggested by a number of economists, um, uh, borrow uh, money uh, because we know we'll get a better return on that on that borrowing if we invest it sensibly. And there is a massive infrastructure deficit in Australia at the moment, a massive infrastructure deficit, because we have governments continuing to ignore um, the need for infrastructure spending. And that's part of this silly debate we've got into around debt. Um, most, again, mainstream economists say if you, if you are investing for productivity building infrastructure, that should be off budget, we've had a separate line up. We're not talking about recurrent spending here, we're talking about spending that will bring in a, a greater return than what we invest. So it should be off budget. Uh, we've said that we could certainly invest up to $50 billion. We've had an inquiry, Peter Wish Wilson, our finance spokesperson has been touring the country, uh, talking to uh, economists, talking uh, to regional communities about the sort of infrastructure that's required. We, we, can, we could borrow up to $50 billion 
we wouldn't affect our AAA credit rating. And provided we do it on sound business case rather than pork barrelling, um, which is sometimes where this debate gets unfortunately caught up in, uh, then what we'll actually do is pro you know, produce a, a, a return for, on that investment. So it's a very simple proposition. Off budget, invest for productivity building infrastructure, make sure there's a sound business case and, um, and really start addressing that infrastructure deficit. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please thank Senator Richard Di Natale. Thank you all for coming. The, the Lowy Institute is absolutely determined to keep foreign policy at the forefront of the uh, national debate during this election. Look out for our, our notes in your email inbox about future events during the campaign and also keep your eye on the interpreter for regular coverage of uh, the election campaign whenever foreign policy touches on the national debate. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.